leaders and now seeing how you know, Democrats in particular have struggled politically with how best to respond to the situation in Gaza in particular. And of course, hearing only recently of Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer calling for elections in Israel and then the U.S. abstaining to vote um, in this UN resolu uh, resolution vote as well um, has just, we've continued to see things escalate. Of course, U.S. officials are trying to downplay this and you know they see it as um, Israel overreacting to the vote, saying that this isn't a change in policy, but it's very clear that that tension continues to grow. Yeah, Ben, I mean, if you read the resolution, it's, uh, you know, it does not mention Hamas, and, and Israel said, let's get the hostages released first as a condition of any negotiation on ceasefire. Anyway, that's... Shame on Biden and shame on... It's no surprise that the United Nations is once again... The United Nations again. ...undermining and attacking Israel at this moment, of course... Israel is our ally. Past, and we better things, wake up and realize it. understand is that the, the Chuck Schumer speech that Steph mentioned uh, really marks... Shame on Chuck Schumer. ...from past and historic... Uh, and uh, a tension between Democrat uh, liberals in, in Washington uh, and uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu. Another step you know, back in the destruction of our Bill country. Clinton tried to prevent him from becoming prime minister. Uh, back in 2012, uh, Obama's own national field director went over to Israel to try to prevent him uh, in terms of his own election. And now we see this happening. Why is uh, diplomats, uh, you know, hug people, you know, in public and then behind the scenes voice their complaints? Instead, I think you saw Chuck Schumer playing for a domestic audience of progressives who are increasingly a loud voice within the Democratic cohort and which this White House is overly, in my opinion, concerned about. Yeah, quickly, uh, Vice President Harris said this weekend she's not ruling out, and the U.S. is not ruling out any consequences uh, if Israel does go into Rafah, uh, Byron. And Senator John Fetterman, Democrat from Pennsylvania, responded, hard disagree. Israel has the right to prosecute Hamas, to surrender, or to be eliminated. Hamas owns every innocent death for their cowardice hiding behind Palestinian lives. Fetterman is turning out to be pretty uh, pro-Israel comments. Fetterman is an increasingly lonely voice uh, the Democratic Party and Israel knows very very well the trends inside the Democratic Party. They're opposed to what Israel uh, is doing now and you're seeing more and more Democrats treating Israel as a client state, a recipient of USA that needs to do what we tell them. That tension is not going to go away. Pal, thanks very much. <laughs> Wake up, America. Vote Republican. Father, tonight, a special day. As you know, the Paris Olympics begins in July, but residents there were treated to quite a show Sunday as waiters in the city participated in a 1.2-mile race while balancing a tray with a croissant, a coffee, and a glass of water. The 110-year-old race was resurrected after a 13-year hiatus in order to get people in the mood, in the Olympic mood. Waiters are expected to have their hands full this summer. Millions flock to the city for the Olympics. Tomorrow on Special Report, Supreme Court jumps back into the abortion debate. We'll bring you that. Remember, if you can't catch us live, set your DVR, 6 p.m. to east, 3 p.m. on the west coast. Thank you for inviting us into your home tonight and every night. That's it for this Special Report. Fair, balanced, and still. Thank you, Brett. Friday. The Anger Mangle is coming up just seconds from now. Um, well, political contributors to cable networks is stuffed with people who were formerly employed by or spokespeople for political campaigns, candidates, even presidents. The most conspicuous example of that being Jen Psaki at NBC, MSNBC, where not only is she on the payroll, she has her own show. Um, I don't know that uh, Joe Scarborough and, and Mika Brzezinski of the, of, the, of the Morning Joe show were upset when that happened. Apparently not, or we would have heard about it. Um, you know, there, there are former press secretaries all over the place. Uh, George Stephanopoulos, who's a very prominent figure on ABC News, was, of course, the press secretary for a time for Bill Clinton and one of his closest aides. Um, these people, of course, are on the other side of the political fence from Ronald McDaniel, who is, after all, a Republican. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Yes, of course, she had some, uh, no doubt, had some criticism to make of, of network news when she was uh, in the role as the party as the party chairman for the Republicans. But uh, this seems to me to be an example of the hermetically sealed bubble in which these, uh, these people on the left live. 
because they simply can't see it from the other side. They don't. It doesn't strike them as at all strange that that in a world in an atmosphere populated with political uh, formers of various jobs with with uh, campaigns and politicians, uh, that it's you know that it, it's silly to be all spun about one of them you don't like. Yeah. I think the main focus for some of these folks has been the 2020 election. Here's an exchange with Welker, Crystal Welker, and uh, Ron McKinney. When you're the RNC chair, you, you kind of take one for the whole team, right? Now I get to be a little bit more myself. And you say as you sit here today, did Joe Biden win the election fair and square? He won. He's the legitimate president. Square. Fair and square, he won. It's certified. It's done. And so, Brent, I guess what's, what's interesting is the lack of a hearing from any Trump-esque voices on other channels. Uh, it's definitely something that you don't hear that much. No, you don't. And, you know, I, I noticed some time back that uh, at one point the New York Times editorial page, an op-ed page, did not have a, sing a single writer or contributor who would defend Donald Trump. Now, look, I have... I have no brief for Donald Trump, um, but I believe that a you know that a well-rounded uh, opinion side, whether it be newspapers or broadcasts, uh, ought to have various voices. And Ronna McDaniel, after all, right now is not even in favor with Donald Trump, but she might be well able to provide some insights into what it was, what what Trump's thinking is, what his people think, and 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 what it's like to be a party chairperson when Donald Trump is in charge. So I think there's a potential for her to be a valuable contributor, except, of course, obviously, that she has, you know, she comes from the wrong party uh, and, as a conservative, holds the wrong political views to get a fair hearing on among NBC staffers who seem determined to flaunt their own biases. Brent, as always, thank you. Thank you. You're on your own. That is the message from Mexico's president regarding drug cartels. Both John and Sandra are off today. This is America Reports. So the former president will make those comments soon from Trump Tower on Wall Street. He spent most of his morning uh, in a New York City courtroom today as his legal team pushed to delay District Attorney Alvin Bragg's hush money case against him. The judge, however, Bill, denied that request and ruled that the case will start on April 15th. So let's go straight to Eric Shaw. He's live outside the New York Supreme Court. So, Eric, what are we expecting? to hear from the former president in just a few moments. Well, we expect a victory lap from the former president because the New York State Appellate Court handed him a big victory, a win in his case uh, here in New York City dealing with his real estate fraud bond. The uh, appellate court basically stopped New York State Attorney General Tisha James cold in her attempts to potentially try and seize any of Trump's assets. The Attorney General has no need now, or at least in the next week or so, to do that. After the appellate court cut that huge bond by more than 68 percent, that means uh, James will not have be necessary for her to try and seize any of Mr. Trump's assets or any of his real estate holdings. This is what the appellate court did. As you know, there was that appellate bond of $454 million that Mr. Trump was Most ridiculous down thing the to pay I've today. ever seen. But the appellate court this morning said that if he pays $175 million over the next 10 days, All that political. will satisfy that for now. So we're Dirty political. So we're breaks on uh, James's attempts to try and seize anything. The president during a court hearing here and the break in that said that he is honored that the uh, bond should have been stopped completely and that he is going to put up the cash it will be my honor to post and we'll post whatever is necessary whether it's cash or security or bonds because you know, this issue we appreciate uh, and respect the appellate division very much what's the level of the bond cash you heard it when he turned around and said cash. He was not as successful, though, in this hearing. This uh, hearing today had to deal with the Stormy Daniels hush money trial. Judge Juan Bershon decided to actually set the date for this trial for April 15th. Trump's attorneys are trying to delay that yet again. 
Mr. Trump faces 34 counts of business fraud dealing with the Stormy Daniels case. That's where he is alleged to have paid the porn star money through his former fixer, Michael Cohen. In that was to ridiculous, that too. During the 2016 presidential election. But the former president said he intends to appeal this ruling, too. Uh, this was a case that had been brought three and a half years ago. And they decided to wait now, just during the election, so that I won't be able to campaign. We'll be appealing this. Well, as it stands now, the very first trial in American history, criminal trial of a former president, is set to kick off in the Jordan behind me in 21 days. I should back to you. Eric Sean, live for us. Let's get right to the former president who's making remarks right now. Let's listen in. Before a lot of them come in, which frankly always makes me happy. So, a lot of things happened today. This is all about election interference. This is all Biden run things, meaning Biden and his thugs, because I don't know if he knows he's alive. And it's a shame. It's a shame what's happening to our country. This is election interference. They are doing things that have never been done in this country before. We've never had anything like it, certainly not at this level, but we've really had nothing like it that I've been able to find. It does happen a lot in third world countries, banana republics. If you look at uh, what we just left, you had a you have a case which they're dying to get this thing started. The judge cannot go fast enough. He wants to get it started so badly, and there's tremendous corruption. You have Pomerantz, Mark Pomerantz. He was Hillary Clinton's lawyer, or the Democrat National Committee's lawyer. He worked in Paul Weiss. He walked in and he took over the the uh, district attorney's office, nobody's ever said anything like that, to prosecute Trump. And then they wouldn't do what he wanted to do, and they, he goes out and he writes a book. Long before any decisions were made, he writes a book about it. And the book gets published, and everybody's reading his book. And the judge said there's nothing wrong with that. And if you look at Bragg, Bragg had a fit over that. Bragg said this trial is now dead. We can't do the trial. Well, that was one of the problems, that, that the judge should have allowed that to happen. And you had other instances, like Colangelo. Colangelo is a radical left from the DOJ who was put into the state, working with Letitia James, and then was put into the district attorney's office to run the trial against Trump. And that was done by Biden and his thugs also, because they can't win an election because of the borders, because of energy prices, because of uh, inflation, because of Afghanistan, the worst and most embarrassing day in the history of our country. He can't win because of Russia, 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 because of all the problems, because of Ukraine being attacked by Russia. And he can't win because of the October 7th attack of Israel, which he should have never allowed to happen, would have never happened if I were president. Ukraine would have never been attacked if I was president. And you wouldn't have inflation if I was president. We didn't have inflation. Um, so all of these things, so what they do is they do election interference, which is court cases, and uh, let's try and tie them up, and let's take as much of his money as possible. I respect the appellate division for substantially reducing that ridiculous amount of money that was put on by a corrupt judge named Ngoran. He ought to be looked at, seriously looked at, especially what he did with valuations. He, he's the one, he's a fraudulent valuator where he values Mar-a-Lago at $18 million, and people say it's worth 50 to 100 times that much, the biggest experts in the business. So he ought to be looked at, and James ought to be looked at, because she tried to get him. She's like the puppet master of the judge. And in our state, this state is losing tremendous prestige. It's losing its companies. It's losing its people. They're fleeing, and violent crime is flourishing. And we can't have that. You can't have that. No city should have that. And it's happening in other cities, but not with the lawfare. The lawfare that they're doing is incredible. So they could have done this in the case of the trial that we just left. One of the many that are going, every single one of them is run by Biden and his thugs. It's the only way they think they can get elected. And I think so far it's backfired because the people of this country understand it. It's backfiring. But they're being run, and they're running all of these different cases. So ridiculous, the cases. Every one of them is ridiculous. 
Uh, you take a look at any one of them and you say any one of them, it wouldn't make any difference. This is all weaponization of DOJ and FBI. They raided my house in violation of a thing called the Fourth Amendment. Not allowed to do that. They raided my house in Florida, Mar-a-Lago. No notice, no nothing. They raided it. I can't believe it. Nobody can believe it. And we'll see how that all works out in the end. But it's illegal what they're doing, it's criminal what they're doing, and it's never been done before in this country. Certainly. Uh, you can't have it's illegal. an election Shameful. in the middle of a political season. We just had Super Tuesday, and we had a Tuesday after Tuesday already, and we had Louisiana the other day, a couple of days ago, and we won in a record number, the highest number ever recorded. And, but we're in the middle of an election right now, and we're fighting crooked Joe Biden. He's the worst president in the history of our country, by far, who's let this country go to hell. The borders, millions and millions of people coming in from prisons, from mental institutions, they're terrorists. Many people coming in from prisons and mental institutions, think of it, and terrorists are coming into our country. And this guy's just letting them come in by the millions. I think we have 15 million people already. People don't say that. I say it. And I'll bet I'm right, too. So right. we're going through this weaponization of our government to try and knock out somebody's political opponent. And so far, based on the polls, it's not working at all. The people understand it. Uh, we have a man who just uh, ruled they'd like the trial to start in 21 days or something. And I don't know how you can have a trial that's going on right in the middle of an election. Not fair. Not fair. It's not fair at all. He knows that, too. He's a Democrat judge. He wants to do that because they're all trying to damage Trump as much as possible. It's having the reverse effect, but maybe someday it won't. I don't know. But it's having the reverse effect. It's a, a terrible, terrible precedent, a terrible thing to do. They could have started this when I left office. You could have gone back three years, more than that. When I left office, all of these things could have been started so we wouldn't be quibbling over Starting this week or that week or two days or three days, it wouldn't have mattered. This thing would have been over two years ago. They could have started. Shameful the way they started. handled this it. Is no case. If you read All Andrew evil Garley's politics. Piece, if you read John Thankful. and Charlie's piece, if you read legal Donald scholars, Trump standing up to world, them. They say this DA case is a hoax and it's something that shouldn't have. It's not even a crime. They say there's no crime. And there is no crime. So I just say it's a sad day for this country. When you have something Absolutely. like this. And remember the words. I know the feeling. Three years ago, if they were going to start it at all, and then you wouldn't be quibbling over what week it's going to end days. They're quibbling over days and hours. They wouldn't be quibbling at all. They never started it. And you know why they didn't start it? Because they didn't know I'd be running. And they didn't know how well I'd do. And if I were not running, or if I were doing poorly like everyone else has done, because they're all gone, they're all knocked out except for crooked Joe Biden. If I were doing poorly, this wouldn't be happening. If none of these trials would have been happening. If I wasn't running, they wouldn't be happening. That's right. So it's a sad day in our country in many respects. Uh, but the good day is that the appellate division was fair. It's a lot of money still, but the judge is corrupt in my opinion. He's the most overturned judge. He's been overturned five times in this case alone. He ruled against me before he even knew anything about the case. He ruled against me. The whole case was all about damages. And there were no damages. And perhaps you'll get him to tell you about what took place in terms of a settlement negotiation, because those weren't the numbers he was discussing. Those weren't the numbers. It's a disgrace what's happening in our country, and we have to get our country back, and we're going to get our country back. That's what's going to happen. November 5th, I believe, will be the most important day in the history of our country. Absolutely. We'll get these people Vote out of Republican. there, and we'll seal up the borders, and we'll... As I say, drill, baby, drill, we'll be drilling, we'll get energy costs down, we'll get rid of the ridiculous electric car mandate, so nobody's ever heard of anything so foolish and so stupid. And we'll bring crime back to law and order, we're going to get those words law and order back, because our cities are, are a disaster. Uh, greatly respect the decision of the appellate division, and we will abide by that, uh, we'll put up and cash or bond very quickly, securities, cash or bond, whatever it is, we'll put it up very quickly and uh, we'll win the case. Um, Todd, maybe I'll have Todd say a couple of words and then I'll have uh, uh, any questions or anything you want to ask. Okay, Todd, wherever you may be.
Please. Thank you, President Trump. So, as we said in court today, um, we very much believe that starting this trial in April, or even starting this trial at any point before before the election, is completely unfair to President Trump. It's completely unfair to the American people who are evaluating who they want to be the next president. And we're going to continue. We are going to continue to fight. We're going to continue to do everything that we can to defend President Trump in that courtroom. And, and like we said today, we believe that we have um, a, a tremendous amount of information now in our hands to help us do that. And, and in any event, we, we certainly feel as if the, the date that, that Judge Rashawn held today, um, April 15th, is not a date we should go to trial, and we're going to continue to fight. And if you read the Andy McCarthy article, or Jonathan Turley, or many of the legal legals, I think almost every single one of them, that's not even a crime. We're being tried for something that's not even a crime. They say at most it's a misdemeanor, but there's no misdemeanor either. So we have violent criminals that are murdering people, killing people. We have drug dealers all over the place, and they go free, and they can do whatever they want. But they go after Trump with there's not even a crime. And did you see the number of people were there? You had Colangelo and behind him, and remember this, Colangelo was a DOJ guy. He's a Biden DOJ guy. Why is he in the Manhattan DA's office trying the case? That in itself is a conflict. He's in the Manhattan DA's office trying the case. I mean, that's called a conflict. And then remember what I told you also, Mark Pomerantz, when Bragg heard about it, he went openly hostile. He said, that's one of the worst things I've heard and you all covered that. Then all of a sudden, time goes by. You know, the great healer's time. Time goes by, and all of a sudden, they forget that. But that's a terrible thing. Colangelo and Pomerantz, terrible thing. And the judge didn't want to rule on that. He said everything was fine. That what they did was fine. I don't think it's fine when they take a Hillary Clinton lawyer and put him in to prosecute me. I don't think that's fine. I think it's very bad. And he does it on the House. He does it without fee. I don't want any fee. I don't want any fee. Our country has gone down a long way. Uh, Cliff, would you like to say something? Just simply, we're gratified by the appellate division's decision today, which shows that there still is a rule of law in New York and that the appellate division is following it. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, you we shouldn't have a trial. This is not a trial. This is not a, an act of criminality. But you are having one. I don't know if we're having one. We're going to be appealing right now. I can tell you that. Uh, we did nothing wrong, just like I did nothing wrong in the other case. My statements, my financial statements, were conservative. They were low, not high. I mean, he valued Mar-a-Lago at a tiny fraction of what it is. He's the fraud. He created a fraud in order to help his narrative and her narrative, because he does whatever she wants. And the judge is really, what he's done is fraudulent. He made Mar-a-Lago, you know it very well, Maggie. He made Mar-a-Lago into $18 million. I had many offers. They said, I'll give you 19, OK? You could take the, half of the living room is worth more than that. So it's worth anywhere from 50 to 100 times that amount. And he stays with it. So he's either whacked out or dishonest, one or the other, or both, probably both. But he's a disgrace to the system. And I think that New York State was helped a lot today by the decision. I'll give you an example. Uh, Truth Social is doing very well. It's hot as a pistol and doing great and it's going public, and the New York Stock Exchange wants to have us badly. And I told them, we can't do the New York Stock Exchange. You're treated too badly in New York. We don't want to do the New York Stock Exchange. And the people at the Stock Exchange are very, very upset about it. The top person is, is mortified, can't believe it. He said, I'm losing business because of New York, because people don't want to be in New York, and they don't want to go into the New York Stock Exchange. So you can ask them about it. But, you know, how can you do that? I'd love to go in the New York Stock Exchange. It was always, you know, it would be a big thing to go in the New York Stock Exchange. That'd be nice. But people aren't going in the New York Stock Exchange now because of what's happening in New York. Because they don't want to be attacked by a thug like this horrible attorney general that we have in New York. The worst in the whole country. So we'll decide about Truth Social and what we do with it. But there's a, just an example of how this is hurting New York and New York State. Yes, right. Can you give us a little bit more detail about the timing of when you plan to secure the bond and how exactly you're planning to pay the bond? Well, as I say, I have a lot of cash. You know I do because you looked at my statements. I mean, you've been examining my statements for a long time. 
and I have much more than that in cash. But I would also like to be able to use some of my cash to get elected. They don't want me to use my cash to get elected. They don't want that. They don't want me taking cash out to use it for the campaign. And they looked at it, and this judge looked at it, and he's part of the whole deal. And why he's such a disgrace for this city. Again, the most overturned judge. There's never been that we can find a, a case where a judge has been overturned now five times. It was four times, now it's five times been overturned. But I have a lot of cash and a great company. I mean, to think they want to go after a company, this is a great company, a company that's doing very well. I've got very low debt on buildings, like this building. I have very low debt on this building. Uh, most buildings, I have no debt. Most clubs, I have no debt. You took, look at my greatest assets, I have no debt. I didn't even include, like, brand value. And the brand values, I became president because of the brand, let's say. But the brand values, it's one of the most valuable brand values. So I think it's, I wouldn't swap it for any other brand in the world, Trump. I don't even put anything down for it. I had very conservative statements. And the way they made them look bad is by valuing Mar-a-Lago at $18 million instead of what the real value is, which is at least 50 to maybe 100 times more. Think of that. This is the fraud. They're creating a fraud, and they're hurting the state so badly. And then I can't go into the New York Stock Exchange because I can't do business, because I don't want to do Not because I can't, because I don't want to do business in New York. And the people at the New York Stock Exchange, I can tell you right now, and they're very fine people, they're not happy. Yeah, you were the You mentioned the cash you have instead of finance and like 500 million, you're trying yeah. to put some of that into the campaign. Now the bond's been reduced. Are you going to start putting money in your campaign? Yeah. You haven't done that since yeah. 2016. Well, first of all, it's none of your business, I mean, frankly. But uh, I, might, I might do that. I have the option. But if I have to spend 500 million on a bond, I wouldn't have that option. I'd have to start selling things. I don't have to sell anything because I'm a, it's a phenomenal company. Look, I built a phenomenal company. Someday they'll actually report that. I built a phenomenal co company that's very low leverage, unbelievably low leverage, with a lot of cash, a lot of everything else. Why should I let a crooked judge make a decision to give $450 million that allows me to spend very little money on my campaign if I so choose? I'll be spending money on my campaign. I might spend a lot of money on my campaign. But I should have that option. A crooked judge shouldn't say, we're going to have you post a bond and take all of that money that I could be spending on the campaign or other things if I want to do other things. So we were gratified by the professionalism of the opinion today. I thought it was a very, I think it's a very important opinion for New York. But uh, the only thing that's going to really solve that problem is when I win, because you're going to have to win. Because no company is going to be coming to New York if I don't win that case. That case is a scam, it's a sham, and it's a hoax. How does this work? And he's right. No, I totally I agree with him. That. I, mean, I think you'd be allowed to, possibly. I don't know. I mean, if you go borrow from a big bank, many of the banks are outside of this. As you know, the biggest banks, frankly, are outside of our country. So you could do that, but I don't need to borrow money. I have a lot of money. I have a lot of, I built a great company. But I don't want to have a crooked judge named Ngoran and a crooked, horrible, the worst, the worst, uh, I would say without question, attorney general in the country, the most obnoxious and the worst attorney general in the whole country. And she did it for political reasons. Go back and take a look at her ads. We will stop Trump. Well, she knows nothing about me. I never heard of her. She was advertising and she took ads in saying, we will stop Trump. We will stop him. Stop him. And vicious. I said, boy, that's a bad one. Then I looked, she got elected. But then she tried to do it with the governor. And it didn't work. She went after the current governor, who's much more talented than she is. She went after the current governor. She was very nasty. And she pulled at about 3%. She pulled at nothing. And after six weeks or seven weeks, she pulled out of the race. She ran for governor, you know, on what she was doing to me. She thought that would work. It didn't work. Uh, I just think that it's very important that, you know, this is a time when businesses have a choice to go to a lot of places, including other countries. They don't have to stay in our country. But they can certainly go also to a lot of other states. A lot of people going to Texas, Florida, Tennessee, North Carolina, a lot of South Carolina. And you have a lot of competition. You shouldn't be persecuting people that have done a great job. I paid $300 million approximately over the years in taxes here. 
300 million. That's a lot of money. And you're gonna lose those people that pay all that money. And you're not even gonna have a state anymore. They just won't be able to do it. Yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, prior to the trial here in three weeks, do you plan to testify and are you the which which hearing? The trial hearing. I don't know that you're gonna have the trial. Well, I don't know how you can have a trial like this in the middle of an election, a presidential election. And this is again, this is a Biden trial. These are all Biden trials because Colangelo works for Biden. Can you imagine they take a guy out of DOJ? and they put him into the Attorney General's office and then into the Manhattan DA's office to go after Trump. These are all Biden trials, so I don't know that you're gonna have it. I think we're gonna get some court rulings. Yeah, please. Well, will you testify if that trial goes forward in three I would have no problem testifying. I didn't do anything wrong. And would you be concerned that the conviction, if you are convicted in that trial, could cost you the election, given what Todd said voters are- Well, it could also make me more popular, because the people know it's a scam. It's a Biden trial. This is a Biden. There is no trial. There's a Biden trial. Colangelo, the man who stood up, had the nerve to actually stand up and take over. You know, he's been sitting in the background for the last year. Today, he went right up front because they figure he buffaloed the whole public and the writers, including you people. He got a buffalo. They forgot. They didn't, you know, a little while ago. Time, time, sort of people forget with time. They don't have good memories. I do. They don't have good memories. But Colangelo, from the DOJ was put there to go after Trump. And today he stood up and he took over the whole office. He's been running the whole thing. He's been signing the letters. He's been doing things for a long time. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. This is all done by the Democrat Party and it's all done by Biden and his group. I don't know if it's Biden because I don't know if Biden is even sharp enough. I don't know if Biden knows what's happening. You want to know the truth? Maybe he does. He probably does. But this is all done by Biden and the thugs that work for Biden. And it's a very bad thing. It's a very dangerous thing for our country. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I admire him completely for hanging in there. 40 Wall Street, uh, Trump Tower, one of those uh, uh, buildings, properties that could have been seized as early as today by A.G. Letitia James, just making remarks there, lengthy remarks, taking questions uh, after finding out uh, a stunning decision by the appeals court in New York to reduce his bond by a whopping 60%. He said he was grateful for the appeals court decision. The appellate division was fair, he said. And he said, Bill, this kind of stuff happens in third world countries yes yes indeed I, I picked up on the respect that he suggested for the appellate division let's see if he's got anything more to say here we'll hang on the shot for a moment uh, for what is considered a significant reduction in the bond they dropped it by about two-thirds that show uh, with regard to the other trial with alvin bragg uh, he said three weeks to the trial suggesting it's a rush job now, uh, there's a lot to get to, and we've got our A-team here to do exactly that. Jonathan Turley and Gary Kubecker Bond and Andy McCarthy are with us now. And um, Well, Turley and McCarthy, your names were invoked several times. And, and, and Andy, I want to start with you, because I think we found the article uh, to which he was referring. Uh, if it's the wrong one, tell us. But this was dated March 23rd, so about, what is that, a week ago? Um, it's over the weekend, right. Yeah. yeah. Bragg falsifies business record charges against Trump. That's the title of your piece. Explain it, Andy. Well, it, there's a lot of problems with this. It would take us an hour just to, to flush out all the problems with this case. But I think at bottom it's ironic that Trump is being charged by Bragg with falsifying his business records when I think the premise of this prosecution is a falsification. That is... Bragg is saying he's bringing a falsified business records prosecution. What he's actually trying to do is enforce federal campaign finance law, which he doesn't have any authority to do. And I think if, if he were being transparent about that, there would have been great outcry about it when the indictment came out. He's played his cards close to the best from the beginning because he doesn't want to come out and say that what he's trying to do is something that the Justice Department and the Federal Election Commission, which are the two federal bureaucracies that are authorized to enforce the campaign finance uh, laws, they looked at this case with respect to Trump and elected not to bring enforcement action because I don't think this is a campaign finance matter. Uh, Bragg is going on the premise that it is and that 
somehow Trump won the 2016 election on account of it. He doesn't really have a statute to hang his hat on in New York for that, and he's trying to enforce federal law. Jonathan Turley, I want to bring you in here because here's the thing. I mean, he, he certainly has gotten a lifeline now, and you can hear the relief in his voice. He's got 10 days now to pay $175 million, which he can absolutely come up with. Letitia James put out a statement here where she wanted to remind uh, the former president that, look, uh, the court has already found, she says, that he engaged in years of fraud and that the judgment, the $464 million judgment plus interest against Trump uh, still stands here. So what's next here after he pays the 175? Because this appeals court could come back and, and decide to reject his appeal. <laughs> well, that's right. <clears throat> you know, the problem with the uh, the original trial decision is really twofold. One is, did he engage in fraud? You know, the uh, the real estate market is uh, rather infamous for undervaluing and overvaluing assets when it comes to loans and taxes. This is a ubiquitous problem uh, in the area. But let's assume that there was over or undervaluation that occurred here. The question then becomes the penalty, which adds a new problem because the the judge showed no restraint at all and and just imposed a figure that most of us believe is absurd. I mean, you, when you drill down on that figure, there's nothing there. There is a lot of speculation. But since you didn't have anyone that lost a dime, since the so-called victims wanted to get new loans from the Trump Corporation, this figure really is quite grotesque in its size, and it does raise constitutional issues. So the Court of Appeals has to look not just at Ultimately, and this, this, there's been a couple of appeals, so these have been divided up. But you have the merits issues that have gone before the Court of Appeals. You're now going to have those uh, questions about the size of this penalty. I can't imagine this penalty being sustained uh, by the appellate court. Uh, it, it was incredibly excessive, and I do believe that Enron had to know that by adopting such a huge figure, it would have been difficult for Trump to appeal his decision without selling property. So Terrible. We, uh, Terrible. From four, six, such eight, a tragedy eight, in uh, our nation. Everybody, million. please go out and vote You're for Donald Trump today, for president. Oh, the sun shines bright. On my old Kentucky home Tis summer, the children at play The corn tops ripe and the meadows are in bloom And the birds make music all the day Weep no more, my ladies, oh weep no more today we will sing one song for my old Kentucky home for my old Kentucky home far away oh the children roll on the little cabin floor all merry all happy and bright by and by hard times comes a knocking at the door then my old kentucky home says good night weep no more my ladies oh weep no more today we will sing one song for my old Kentucky home for my old Kentucky home far away. God bless America. God bless Kentucky. And God bless all those who are fighting for godly principles fighting for godly principles, including President Donald Trump.
and including Julie Jaddock for state senator in the 17th district and including Kim Mosier for state representative in our district. God bless them all. God bless them all. Just terrible offenses have we seen committed in the city of New York just in the last few days. We've had fatal subway pushings. We've had uh, a, a police officer murdered. We've had shootings. We've had, and every time a suspect is arrested for one of these things, it inevitably turns out that this is an individual who has 10, 15, 20, 30 prior arrests. How many more times do we need this to happen before we change course? And unfortunately, the answer of the New York City Council and the Democrats in the New York State Assembly and Senate is, well, not yet. Uh, Raphael, stand by one moment. We're seeing a picture now. Former President Trump has just come out of the wake. He stepped outside. We were expecting, are expecting, for him to possibly give some comments. Let's take a closer look and see if he is going to step up to the microphone that has been set up outside. As you noted earlier, Julian, there are officers now ringing that area. It certainly looks like it was being prepared for him to come and speak. Uh, that is that position there that we think he may be heading towards. Um, as we wait and see, obviously, security always very happy in the presence of a uh, presence of a former or current commander in chief, uh, and it looks like that may be indeed where he is heading, and we'll hear from him directly. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I want to thank Bruce and all of the people that have worked so hard to make this area beautiful and safe. And this is what happened. Is such a sad, sad event. It's such a horrible thing. And it's happening all too often, and we're just not going to let it happen. We just can't. 21 times arrested this thug, and uh, the person in the car with him was arrested many times, and they don't learn because they don't respect. They don't. They're not given the respect. The police are the greatest people we have. There's nothing, and there's nobody like them. And this should never happen. I just visited with a very beautiful wife that now doesn't have her husband. Stephanie was uh, just incredible. Their child, brand new, beautiful baby, sitting there, innocent as can be, and doesn't know how his life has been changed. But uh, the Diller family will, you'll never be the same. You can never be the same. And we have to stop it. We have to stop it. We have to get back to law and order. We have to do a lot of things differently because this is not working. This is happening too often. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And again, I want to just thank all of you folks for uh, allowing this. And Bruce, thank you. Bruce has been a friend of mine for a long time. He's done an incredible job out here. But uh, this is such a sad occasion. Uh, the only thing we can say is maybe something is going to be learned. We've got to toughen it up. We've got to strengthen it up. This should never be allowed. Things like this shouldn't take place and to take place so often. So. Thank you all for being here. It's an honor, and it's an honor for me to be here. This is a great family, the Diller family. I met the friends, and I met every one of them inside, and these are just incredible people that are just devastated. They're devastated. They've got a tough road. It's going to be a very tough road. 
So thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. I just want to say, I just want to say thank you to President Trump uh, for coming here to be with the Diller family. It was very comforting for them. It was very warm inside, and uh, people were very, very, uh, they were very blessed to have someone like President Trump who cared so much, spent a lot of time with the family, and was, uh, again, a tremendous comfort to the family and probably the most difficult time this family's ever had. May God bless Stephanie. Ryan, we are going to help raise because he's only one years old and he's going to grow up without a dad, but he's going to have thousands of dads that are going to look after him and uh, to Fran, his mother, and to Jessica, Jennifer and, and Jason, uh, his brother and sister, and the whole family, Aunt Carol, Uncle Jimmy. Uh, our hearts go out to them and may God bless them and may God bless America. Thank you. So, um, somewhat subdued. Wonderful that he came and showed up to be with the family there. Family and Stephanie, now the widow of fallen officer Jonathan Diller talking about how things have to change. He says we have to stop this. We have to be doing things differently. Um, he talked repeatedly about what an honor it was to be there and praising uh, the men and women in uniform, saying that, you know, police are the best people that we have. There's no one like them. Um, and saying we got to toughen things up. You heard him, uh, Jillian, take that question there uh, towards the, the end of, of walking away. You never know how much of the questions he's going to entertain. but. It sounded like clearly today he wanted the focus to be on this officer and his grieving loved ones. But hinting at policy, he did say we, the answer to that question, Shannon, was we got to toughen up mm -hmm. so that this doesn't happen again. Let's go ahead and bring back in Nicole Parker, former FBI special agent. Nicole, what do you make of the president's comments and the Nassau County executive's comments there as well? I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Because again, these are NYPD officers here, but they're law enforcement officers nationwide. And they feel like they have not had a voice. They've had no rights. They've been silenced. And you know, they've been hamstrung. They haven't been able to do their jobs. And to hear uh, you know, an elected official and someone who's running for president say, you know what, we've got your back. We understand. I don't care if you love President Trump, hate President Trump. I don't really care where you stand on the political spectrum, but it does matter that there is a commander in chief who backs the blue and who understands the sacrifice that these law enforcement officers are making. Absolutely. And to hear discuss the wife, let me tell you right now, it's numb. I mean, she's completely numb. To get that news Monday, absolutely devastating. Right now she's like, what just happened? Her life has been turned upside down. And the support, you need all the support you can get. And let me just explain this as well. The day of the funeral and all these memorial services, thousands of people are coming and they're supporting you and, and, and they've got you and, and it's important. And you remember who showed up. You do. But I can tell you it's going to start to get quiet too. Mm -hmm. And when all the media leaves and the fanfare leaves and the accolades leave, Americans, please do not let your support for law enforcement leave. Continue to back the blue. Amen. Remember these families, the Tunnel to Towers and, and their ability to help these family members is phenomenal get involved make a difference in your community this is really for me a call to americans we need light we need truth and we need to come together as a country and sometimes it takes a tragedy such as this to bring us together but this is not just an nypd problem this is happening nationwide Absolutely. and sometimes people watch television at home and they're like what can i do to help there's a lot you can do to help there are a couple things Stand Definitely behind your police force. Who you believe are going to make Lift your spirits safer, up. Pray with them and for them. Be a part of their lives. As Commissioner of Motor <laughs> yeah, Vehicles, I had said, a lot of officers working for me. And I love and respected them. Even back to the days when I was a cadet policeman for the ROTC at the University of Kentucky. The respect I had for the police officers. And of course, my nephew, Robbie. The person who's out there in uniform. And we always have to be thinking about them. Robbie Long, the police officer in Cincinnati. God bless them all. recidivism rates. Percentage of people released under bail reform and re-arrested re within two years is 66%.
What does that say to you, Nicole, about the group of people who are committing these crimes over and over? Do you know what it tells me? It tells me that they know that there's not going to be any consequence for their behavior, and they really don't care. And they're like, you know what? Forget you. I'm going to keep doing this over and over, and guess what? I might get a little slap on the wrist, but I'll be right back at it as soon as I get out of jail. That's unacceptable. That is unacceptable. This has got to stop. And I, again, I'm not sure what it's going to take to wake people up, but, but we deserve better. Our country deserves better. Our communities deserve better. Vote. You deserve for Donald to feel safe. Trump, you President. deserve to have law enforcement officers that are being Look treated at the four with respect. Years he served. They're leaving the, this, this, their careers in trouble because you know what? what they don't feel that they matter. They don't feel supported. They got spit in their faces. I'm not sure if you all understand it's this, time to but go they were back literally people spitting in their faces. Okay, and you have to take that abuse and just keep doing your job. That and, says and what he means there's a special and does thing what about he says. And law enforcement officers, again, they don't do it for the money. They genuinely love the communities that they serve. And again, I'm going to acknowledge there are always a few bad apples out there, and I see it. I've, I've seen it in the FBI. I see it everywhere. Law enforcement agencies, cops, FBI agents. Yeah, there's going to be some bad ones out there. There's some bad apples, and I don't excuse that. And we do need to hold law enforcement to a high standard. That Americans deserve that as well. But this overall defund the police nonsense, it's 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 dangerous. Ridiculous. It's and to it unwind is. that. I don't know how long it's going to take, but if you went to, to a parent who is now an NYPD officer, for instance, and they said, I, I, I know children myself, they, their parents who are cops are saying, don't go into law enforcement, I don't recommend it. How sad is that? Hmm. As an NYPD officer or any law enforcement officer, you should want to encourage your, your children to go into law enforcement and to carry on that legacy. Absolutely. But not the way that they're being treated right now. It's not going to happen. And, and a lot of people are, you know, they're just working so hard to get to the pension. How about we restore our criminal justice system back to the part, the, the point where people want to be cops again? They feel supported. They feel that they matter and that they can do their jobs properly. And, and to me, that would be my biggest hope for our nation right now. Amen. Mm -hmm.